started now with our next portion, which is focused on methamphetamine use. Uh, and Jared Klein is gonna be talking to us about this. Jared, I see your slide. It looks, looks good. So you can get started whenever you're ready. Great, thanks for you. Sorry, I was getting set up with the, I wanna be able to see the chat and stuff. So thanks everybody for joining today. Um, I'm Jared Klein, I'm a internist and addiction doc. I work with Jamie and Tree at Harborview and um, it's nice to see some familiar um, faces when folks, yeah, did have video on, some people have video on. Um, whatever works for you though today, we have about, you know, 40 minutes or so to talk a little bit about methamphetamine use. Um, and um, I think we should hop right in. And then after that, the plan is to break into um, three groups um, and you'll, each group will have either Jamie, myself or Amy Kennedy from the VA um, to kind of go through a case that will um, just to the chat um, that will kind of review some of these things, hopefully generate some good discussion. So that's kind of the plan for the rest of the morning. And uh, yeah, just appreciate everybody being here. So um, let's launch right in on no disclosures from me, except we will discuss off use label of um, our off label use of medications, um, because there are no FDA approved medications for methamphetamine use, but I did want to um, get folks a little bit of update about the evidence around medications for meth use. So, um, so here are the learning job objectives, we want everyone to be able to recognize the significance of the current epidemic of, epidemic of methamphetamine use, which I think um, is people, folks are seeing in regular clinical practice pretty regularly, unfortunately, now. Um, and we also want to help folks feel more comfortable counseling about at least uh, two evidence-based treatments that are available for patients using methamphetamines. And then finally, kind of to weigh the risks and benefits of non-FDA approved medication treatments for meth use disorder. So a reminder before, two reminders actually, before we get started. The first reminder is that methamphetamine use is not the same as methamphetamine use disorder. Um, so just, uh, uh, I think we see so much methamphetamine use and some folks will use kind of intermittently and periodically and wouldn't necessarily meet the DSM-5 criteria for methamphetamine use disorder, which include these key kind of symptoms here, loss of control, cravings, negative social consequences and tolerance and withdrawal. So when you see somebody who's using methamphetamine, it is important to take a moment and kind of clarify um, whether they've not, maybe not so much the quantity or frequency of use, but just explore some of these questions just to kind of see whether they meet that criteria for methamphetamine use disorder. Cause it's really the folks with the methamphetamine use disorder that are the ones we want to target our recommendations around a behavioral or medication or both um, forms of treatments. Um, it, you still might want to counsel someone with a methamphetamine use about like unhealthy, you know, some of the health risks of intermittent periodic use, but um, it's the ones that meet the criteria for use disorder that, um, might need more support and resources. The last, the, the second reminder, and I'll try to keep my time on the soapbox brief here, but just as around terminology, a reminder about um, kind of uh, trying to use um, patient-centered, patient-friendly, neutral, medically accurate ter um, terminology when uh, seeing folks and working with folks with any addiction, but for specific to um, folks with methamphetamine use, avoiding terms like meth addict or method and using the person first language person with a meth use disorder, um, and then avoiding the old DSM-4 criteria, meth abuse or dependence and using methamphetamine use disorder as the kind of um, DSM-5 current terminology. And these other things are kind of similar to other substance use disorders, so. All right. So, um, this is review, I'm gonna be brief, but just a reminder about how reinforcing um, methamphetamines are and a reminder on the neurobiology of methamphetamine use. So um, this is studies that were done a long, long time ago and I um, have been repeated in various contexts, either done in with animal models or um, using like fMRI. Um, but it it looks at the this particular study, they administered various uh, reinforcing substances and looked at the, percentage of the baseline dopamine um, kind of release in key areas of the brain. Uh, so with morphine, you had like about a 200, like a, a doubling of the dopamine release and it was kind of relatively 
slow over the course of a certain number of hours. Cocaine more reinforcing, you know, more like 300% of the base, baseline dopamine level. Um, but with methamphetamines, you know, it was tenfold um, increase in uh, the dopamine. And it was in, also incredibly rapid, which also plays into um, some of the reinforcing nature of um, uh, methamphetamine in particular. So as I think we've all borne witness to over the last several years, um, there are really um, kind of striking increases in overdose rates in the US and um, psychostimulants, um, which methamphetamine represent the overwhelming majority of these um, are really, especially in the last you know, five years or so, we've seen quite dramatic um, and, and concerning increases in stimulant involved and methamphetamine involved um, fatal overdoses in the US. The other kind of epidemiologic aspects I'd like to touch on briefly are just the fact that um, we're seeing a diversification in the patient populations that are being affected by methamphetamine use disorders. This is a study, a recent study from JAMA Psychiatry um, that demonstrates, I think historically we saw certain populations, especially um, men who have sex with men, um, kind of characterizing that the, their the use of methamphetamines was more common, um, but really we've seen dramatic increases in um, all different populations here as far as sexual orientation. And then um, when we look at uh, racial ethnic groups, um, similarly, we've seen really um, huge uh, increases in methamphetamine use among populations that maybe in the past weren't as, um, as significantly affected. So, I highlighted here in Black Americans, there's over a, a tenfold increase in methamphetamine use. Um, this is over the past, I think it was a, about the past decade, sorry, I can't remember, and it's not on the slide. <laughs> um, but, um, and this was, this was specifically among non-injection use. Um, so uh, really um, dramatic increases. It's interesting here, the American Indian and Alaska Native, there was no significant difference, but I didn't show this. There's a separate study by the same group that showed that um, actually Native American and Alaska Natives are, have been disproportionately affected by overdose deaths uh, involving um, psychostimulants or methamphetamine, um, even though their rates of um, use haven't changed as dramatic, dramatically based on this. All of this uh, goes to show that there are huge societal costs, and this is a couple years old at this point, but, um, and so it's, I would imagine it's only worse than this, um, but, um, you know, a huge cost as far as um, criminal legal involvement um, and, and as well as healthcare um, costs related to um, methamphetamine use. So, We've had increasing use, uh, more risky use, more overdose, and you know, uh, diversification of the populations that have been affected, and, and these huge societal um, costs or burdens, um, and all that speaks to this urgent need to increase and improve treatment options, to increase access to harm reduction strategies. Um, of course, treating co-occurring disorders, uh, whether they're co-occurring um, substance use disorders or co-occurring mental health disorders, or um, you know, the resultant uh, medical complications, and um, really to try to particularly target the diverse populations uh, for those prevention and treatment um, services. So with all that said, what I want to do is take a chunk of time and review these four behavioral treatments, and then we're going to review four medication treatments um, before we touch on harm reduction. So, because I think that's kind of depressing, and I want to spend most of the time, most of the talk, talking about like there are things that can actually help people. Um, there are effective treatments, and let's kind of talk about talk about them a little bit. I am intentionally starting with the behavioral treatments first because these really have the best evidence. Um, the only caveat to that is that um, mo many many studies of behavioral treatments um, were done in populations primarily using cocaine. Um, I I'm not going to point. When, when we talk about examples, I'm going to try to focus more on the ones related to um, methamphetamines, but um, there just has been less, generally less research around methamphetamine because um, I think for several reasons, one, um, historically, um, they weren't as widespread in, um, in, a, in the U.S. and 
I would argue that their use is less common on um, like in the Northeast corridor and places where, um, you know, there's a, a more research being conducted. Um, that's where cocaine was more prevalent. Um, uh, similarly, uh, when we think about the urban rural divide, you know, uh, rural parts of the US have been kind of more uh, affected by methamphetamine, especially historically. Um, so I think that there's growing recognition that there needs to be um, more research around you know, treatments for methamphetamine use disorder. All right, so let's go through each of these behavioral treatments. So first, motivational interviewing. Um, I think folks are going to be familiar with this, at least the principles of it. Um, it's a communication de technique designed to help folks resolve their ambivalence around um, uh, their methamphetamine use, or in this case, methamphetamine use, um, with a real focus on you know empathetic connection. Um, thinking about and having the patient kind of focus on reasons to make a change and pointing out folks' self-efficacy and their resilience. Um, it can be delivered by any provider or peer. You know, most of the studies are conducted with um, not like what we consider like motivational interviewing, like spending two minutes during a clinic visit or a couple minutes like when a patient's discharging, but like actual, um, you know, 15 minute or longer, like sometimes hour long sessions um, on a regular basis over a course of time, like usually a typical treatment course might be six to 12 weeks. Um, there is strong evidence that this can um, reduce uh, folks' methamphetamine use um, and re retain them in treatment. There's at least, um, and when I say strong evidence here, what I'm, um, that's defined as with some of these, um, either the SAMHSA um, document or uh, systematic reviews have been done, that kind of generally means there's been at least two or more randomized clinical trials showing a positive effect of the intervention. Um, so uh, motivational interviewing, a good thing to talk about uh, with patients and, and something that's pretty widely offered um, when we think about like the behavioral health um, agencies uh, locally. So contingency management is um, another kind of highly effective technique. It's probably um, among the behavioral uh, treatments. It's probably the one that has the most evidence when we think about stimulant use. Um, and it basically operates on, on this uh, the principles of operant conditioning, like um, incentivizing folks to attend treatment. Positive reinforcement is another way to put this. Um, and you can incentivize folks to either attend treatment. You could incentivize them to provide negative urine specimens. In other contexts, you might be incentivizing somebody to take medication regularly. Um, there's different ways that this kind of is um, kind of practically or logistically done. There's something called the fishbowl method, which is um, literally folks draw a prize out of a fishbowl. Um, and there's usually escalations in the rewards. So like as folks have more con consecutive um, appropriate urine tests or more consecutive uh, appointments that have been kept, um, you get kind of more draws from the bowl. Uh, the voucher method is um, folks get a, a voucher for a higher value as they string together more and more um, of the desired uh, behavior. It can be delivered in um, either primary care or specialty care settings, um, often does require frequent urine drug testing, and it also requires um, a little bit more kind of intensive <clears throat> staff training and um, staff resources to kind of uh, run the contingency management kind of program. Um, but, you know, a 12-week treatment course has been most well studied, um, and um, there have been, you know, quite a few studies, I'll say, of um, contingency management um, randomized control size of condition management showing benefit for folks specifically with methamphetamine use disorder. I think the downside of um, contingency management, I don't think I necessarily put this in here, but downsides of contingency management, of course, are that um, not only it takes us more, more research, there's just more limited availability of this. So actually one of the institutions that's done a really nice job of rolling out contingency management is the VA. Uh, most addiction treatment centers within the VA have a contingency management program embedded within that. I think they have the benefit of um, you know, as a single payer system, they can decide kind of where to direct funds. Um, in the fee for service kind of setting, you know, there's not very clear right now, there aren't clear kind of reimbursement mechanisms for contingency management. Um, so, um, in addition to the kind of staffing and um, startup um, challenges, there's this um, financial kind of challenge of, of operating a contingency management program um, kind of in, in many settings. So, but definitely a valuable tool. 
So the, the community reinforcement approach is um, really, a, it's basically a multi, this multi-pronged intervention that includes um, regular, um, typically one-on-one -on -one counseling, but it can be group counseling also, job skills or vocational training. Um, really, it's the idea is to support folks to build new social networks, and it's often combined with contingency management, and it's usually delivered in inpatient or kind of residential settings where folks can kind of live in this community and, um, you know, uh, network with folks and build build uh, new kind of relationships that aren't focused around the substance use. Um, typically, a little bit longer program, like 24 um, weeks, is often what's been studied. And then finally, cognitive behavioral therapy. I think we're mostly familiar with uh, cognitive behavioral therapy kind of techniques. Also, it's really a psychotherapy technique that. Um, has folks reconsider their um, the prior patterns of thinking um, and the negative feelings about substance use. It can be kind of reinforcing. And the, the goal is to really develop realistic strategies and to change the way folks think um, about both their own ability to make change um, and um, their ability to kind of move past the, the substance use. Um, usually delivered one-on-one -on -one by trained providers, often with like weekly out, one-hour sessions. Um, so also good evidence for that. So generally, these behavioral treatments, despite the strong evidence, they do have lots of limitations so that the draw in, especially in, I will say, outside of the uh, kind of research or study context, the dropout tends to be quite high um, when folks are enrolled in behavioral treatment uh, or behavioral programs. Um, and that's particularly true for folks who are using stimulants. Um, and dropout we know predicts, you know, return to use. Um, access, as I mentioned a little bit before, is limited, um, particularly for contingency management, it's limited, but really, um, you know, there's a lot of um, bars that people have to meet and kind of hoops that folks have to jump through in order to enroll in um, many of these behavioral um, health uh, or behavioral treatment programs, um, intake appointments and um, only available at certain locations and kind of, um, it, it, it can be quite challenging for folks, especially if folks are either struggling with other uh, social stressors or, um, you know, are disorganized as a result of their um, stimulated use, which is not un uncommon. Um, and then John commented on the durability results. So um, a little bit variable, but there is concern um, for some of the treatments that, um, you know, I've seen for conditions management, for example, once those um, once the incentives kind of go away, there's there's a concern that there's some um, slippage in the um, in the in the um, uh, success rates of um, of the uh, of the treatment. So, um, and I mentioned already that there's more evidence for all these for cocaine uh, folks using cocaine compared to methamphetamines. Maybe I'll stop for a second there and see if folks see what other questions anyone has about uh, the behavioral treatments, which I kind of reviewed high level. I didn't go into a lot of detail because we typically aren't gonna be the ones like delivering the behavioral treatments to our patients. I think it's more about kind of being aware what some of these treatments are and being able to talk with folks about kind of where you might access this and what they might look like, um, what different forms of that, that treatment might look like. But generally, these are treatment. This, these are treatments provided by, you know, psychologists, social workers, um, chemical dependency, or what they now call substance use disorder professionals, um, in a in a kind of behavioral health setting. Some can be delivered in a form in other settings, like in a primary care setting, um, but it's it's just a little more challenging. So yeah. Thanks for you asked the study, is there confounding these studies from patients who are able to be more organized, show up for appointments, have fewer social stressors, more likely have good outcomes. So I don't know about, I don't know if I'd use the term confounding, but there's certainly um, concerns about external validity or generalizability for the studies. Like anybody who's enrolling in a study and is um, coming regularly to appointments and has met that kind of um, threshold um, to, to enroll and to really participate um, is probably, um, in some way or multiple ways different than um, other folks that we might be seeing in clinical practice. So I think that's a great point that you bring up. And then what are some places around Seattle providing services? Any particular any particular place we should be referring to? So these are the folks uh, or the places, um, thanks for, um, for the question. Um, 
these are the places um, you probably heard folks talking about. So um, it's any of these behavioral health organizations like Sound, used to be called Sound Mental Health, Valley Cities, um, uh, Harborview Mental Health Addictions, uh, Harborview Mental Health Services, um, HMHS, uh, DESC has a behavioral health uh, treatment program. I'm probably missing others. Jamie, I don't know if you have other examples, but those are kind of the types of organizations. There are some SUD specific clinics and hospitals and things that might um, also provide those services. The other thing I'd point out is that many tribal programs will provide um, not only some of these treatments, but also um, kind of um, you know, tribal specific um, and culturally kind of appropriate um, uh, treatment options for folks. So many of the local tribes um, have uh, substance use resources as part of their uh, kind of offerings. What other questions do folks have? Nice, okay. Feel free to keep putting questions in the chat or you can just unmute and interrupt me. That's fine too. We have, we're doing great on time. So um, what about medication treatments <laughs> since we're all docs and like to prescribe medications or at least that's the tool that is more in our wheelhouse <laughs> a little bit. Um, so it's a little bit, this is a tough thing. Um, there have been many, many medication trials. So I, this is a kind of a partial list from the systematic review a few years ago of um, studies that have, or of uh, medications that have been studied um, with mixed, very, very mixed results. I would say by and large, most of the medication trials, there's a, a fairly modest um, effect if there is a positive effect from the medication. Um, and um, for many, there have been actually no, uh, no effects. So you can see folks have tried stimulants, <laughs> um, they've tried uh, antidepressants, they've tried antipsychotics, they've tried opioid agonists and antagonists, anti-epileptic drugs, um, just a whole bucket of, of things. Um, I'll highlight, I wanna highlight, just like we did with the four behavioral treatments, I wanna highlight four medication treatments with this big caveat that I put there at the top that none of these are FDA approved. So this would be off-label use of the medications. And we'll go through in a little bit more detail some of what the studies um, have shown. These studies, unlike the behavioral treatments, are also often, um, even though they're randomized controlled trials, are generally like smaller and um, there are quite a few limitations that I'll try to highlight as we go through. So starting with mirtazapine, as folks know, this is an antidepressant, kind of works similar to a tricyclic antidepressant, uh, boosts norepinephrine and serotonin levels in the brain. And most common study doses are, you know, most people, most of the studies get people on 30 milligrams a day. Obviously, mirtazapine, you can dose, the typical dose range is 15 to 45 milligrams, but um, for most of these studies, the target dose was 30 milligrams a day. Um, so there were two studies of this um, about a decade apart from the same group um, down in San Francisco. Go uh, RCTs that really specifically the first one enrolled men who have sex with men, and the second one enrolled men and trans men and trans women who have sex with men. Um, it was a little bit larger study. Um, so from the first study, they um, demonstrated there were more negative uh, urine drug tests in the mirtazapine group. So more um, negative urine drug tests for methamphetamines in the mirtazapine group with a number needed to treat of three for absence from meth methamphetamine. There were no differences in retention between the group, but this is a pretty small study. Um, so they basically repeated the trial um, about a decade later and doubled the size, still only about 120 um, subjects were enrolled. Um, and again, they demonstrated more negative urine um, analysis, more urine, uh, negative urine drug screens for methamphetamine in the uh, mirtazapine group. Um, interestingly, the, the effect persisted out of treatment and the adherence was um, quite low. Um, so, you know, I think that this, for me, this, the fact that there, there have been these two randomized clinical trials, that's, um, that's uh, helpful. The other 
thing that, you know, mirtazapine is pretty familiar to us, I think. And um, for folks, especially if folks are having um, sleep challenges, um, you know, I think it's a reasonable option um, to, to consider and to talk with patients um, who are using methamphetamines. But obviously, if folks fall out of this particular, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, group of, either of men who have sex with men or uh, trans women have sex with men, then they that you know they weren't included in these studies per se, um, but um, something to something to think about. So there has been one RCT of adults with methamphetamine use disorder um, looking at topiramate, uh, which is an anticonvulsant, of course, um, and um, the typical dosing you can see here, fifty to two hundred milligrams a day. Um, so this study didn't improve abstinence rates, which was, which was the primary outcome, but it did reduce the amount of methamphetamine taken um, based on self-report, which was a secondary outcome. It also reduced rates of returning to use in those who are already abstinent, which was a kind of subsequent subgroup analysis. Um, I think that the challenge with that, of course, is that many folks who we're seeing are actively using, um, they're, you know, unless they're coming out of like a behavioral health setting or a, a criminal legal setting or something like that, um, which makes um, makes it a little bit um, challenging to feel like this is um, kind of very evidence driven use of of topiramate. Um, but uh, you know, it is something to to think about. There's actually been five RCTs, at least five RCTs. Um, of uh, methylphenidate, which is a stimulant. Um, and uh, you can see the typical doses here, 18 to 54 milligrams a day. Um, there have been mixed results with that. So two studies found a small reduction in methamphetamine use. Um, for example, uh, you know, 6% of the samples are negative for meth in the active treatment group versus, you know, a little bit less than 3% in the placebo group. Uh, so it's half as many people using methamphetamines, but, um, uh, or not using methamphetamines, um, I'm sorry, twice as many folks not using methamphetamines, but it still means that like, you know, the overwhelming majority of folks were still using methamphetamines. And so, um, and some three of the other trials showed no difference in, uh, or sorry, none of the trials showed a difference in retention um, it, between the study arms. So um, some folks argue that these studies um, use relatively low doses of the medication. Um, it's also, like I mentioned with the Tapirmite study, these generally were done where folks were uh, coming out of a detox type of setting prior to starting treatment, um, which isn't uh, feasible for everyone or desirable for everyone. Um, and it's really unclear. They, they haven't done good, um, necessarily um, good studies focusing on folks with concurrent ADHD um, and methamphetamine use disorder. So um, I think that's kind of on an ongoing area of investigation. Uh, there's also active studies of other um, uh, CNS stimulants, uh, other stimulant medications besides methylphenidate. So I think this is an area of interest in active research, but really um, right now, not, I think, solid evidence uh, for doing this, particularly outside of um, the, the context of somebody having um, you know, concurrent ADHD, I think that there, some folks will say that that's a reasonable indication to use these medications if somebody has clearly, uh, clearly diagnosed um, ADHD. And then finally, this was in the, um, in the, I don't know if news, but it was kind of a more recent um, study of bupropion combined with extended release naltrexone. Um, as a study from New England Journal last year, um, RCT with about 400 adults who had meth use disorder. Obviously, um, bupropion is an antidepressant and naltrexone is opioid antagonist. They dosed it 450 milligrams of the extended release um, bupropion daily plus 300 milligrams of the IM naltrexone once a month. Um, the primary outcome was having at least three of four urine samples negative for meth during the last kind of month of the study period. Um, and you could see here that um, 13 percent of the folks in the active treatment arm met that criteria versus just three less than three percent in the placebo arm. Um, the limitations there are lots of limitations of the study unfortunately, including the fact that folks that were using opioids concurrently were excluded, which is at least of the folks that I typically see many folks are using opioids and methamphetamines concurrently um, so they would not have been included in this study um, and there was um, really high adherence and low dropout, which I think um, points to Rebecca's um, question or comment about um, uh, 
kind of external uh, validity or generalizability. I mean, these are folks that were very motivated um, or incentivized to kind of be part of the study and, um, you know, stayed in the study. And they, they might, that might not be um, characteristic of folks that we're seeing kind of in regular clinical practice. So that's what I have about medications. Um, I think that there's, um, you know, I think we should be thinking about medications you know, in my clinical practice, um, you know, talking about bupropion and naltrexone when, when I do see folks who aren't using um, opioids concurrently is reasonable. And then really mirtazapine for folks, um, for other folks uh, that might be interested in medications, especially if they have sleep problems. For me, those are kind of the more kind of accessible treatments uh, to, to consider and to talk with folks about. And hopefully there'll be more data coming as um, there are many, many more studies underway. Um, of different options. My last comment is on, um, don't forget about harm reduction. I think Jamie talked about this some. Um, harm reduction is important for uh, folks using methamphetamines also. Um, and I like this, there's um, the, these resources from the UW Harm Reduction Research and Treatment Lab or Heart Lab um, that you can look up and um, they kind of characterize it in these three bins of options for folks to think about. Like there's ways to stay healthier while still using the same amount of drugs. Like you could test your drugs for fentanyl. You could you know, stay hydrated. There are many, many other ways you can do this. Um, you could also use more safely. So that would be like ingesting instead of injecting or using with other people around. And they have many other examples of those types of things in this category. And then finally, you could use less, either set a limit or take a break or um, things like that um, if folks want to use less. And all of these are something short of complete abstinence uh, from substances, um, which we do think is important for folks and important for reducing the um, health risks of uh, these substances. So, all right, I'm gonna stop there and see if there are any questions, see what questions there are before we break into we maybe a little break and then go into our discussion groups. So thanks, John. What do you counsel patients are signs of symptoms that should trigger medical attention immediately? Um, is this in the context of like concern about methamphetamine kind of overdose or kind of meth, you know acute methamphetamine intoxication? I think that's kind of what you're yep. talking about. Um, okay. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. Um, great question. Um, you know, that, that's probably the most um, common, uh, it's a quite common uh, thing that will happen. It's, you know, it's the, the symptoms are concurrent with um, overdose or acute intoxication from any stimulant. So it's quite similar to um, cocaine with the maybe possible exception that sometimes there's growing concern about more neuropsychiatric type symptoms with acute methamphetamine use. Um, I didn't get into all this, but there's some concern that the um, changes in the way that methamphetamines have been uh, manufactured recently have made it kind of more um, neurotoxic or neuroactive. And so, um, so anyway, all that to say clinically, like if somebody's presenting with suicidality or um, ideas of self harming self or others, and they need to seek care, obviously the cardiovascular effects. So if somebody's experiencing chest pain, um, signs or symptoms of um, kind of uh, acute heart failure, then they would need to um, need to come in and get uh, evaluated right away. Um, there are also other you know, depending on the route of use, folks can get other complications um, kind of specific to the route of use, whether it's inhaled or um, injected, uh, for example. So I don't, Jamie, do you have other thoughts about that? Well, just to say that there's some, the National Coalition on Harm Reduction and some there's some advocates of changing the language from overdose to overamping in the context of methamphetamine to kind of get at this idea. It's, it's a, a much more varied syndrome of problematic, acute problematic use than respiratory depression in, in an opioid overdose. So you, you have to counsel people about the risks of respiratory depression because there could be opioids that mixed in there, but then all the other stuff you talked about, Jared, is kind of discussed in harm reduction circles around how to recognize and avoid overramping, and that's you know stroke-like symptoms, chest mm -hmm. pain, 
um, uh, uh, psychosis um, and, uh, and kind of seeking a quiet, calm place, hydrating or seeking medical attention if you have any of those symptoms. I guess a similar uh, a related question would be like, what about um, withdrawal symptoms? So methamphetamine withdrawal, I mean, it's the typical thing where the withdrawal syndrome is tends to be the opposite of the intoxication syndrome. And so most folks um, are tend to be withdrawn, depressed, sedated, kind of um, uh, dysphoric, et cetera, in a withdrawal phase. And you'll often see this in the hospital. Um, uh, with, you know, folks, I, I don't like the term meth crash, but that's what I hear being used often. Um, um, but folks, you know, it's typically can be a, you know, a day or a couple of days where they're quite um, kind of can be all the way to altered potentially often just kind of more like kind of sedated and um, uh, kind of, you know, rousable, but like, you know, not interested in talking much. So and we typically don't treat that with any kind of targeted um, medications or anything like that. Jared, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate you mentioning the retention as a problem for both the studies, but then also um, in practical application of treatment for, for these folks. Any suggestions on how to improve retention would it be accurate to say that behavioral therapies are more targeted to retention and thus like combining behavioral therapy with pharmacotherapy with like bupropion and naltrexone, for example, uh, might be preferable? Um, um, yeah. Yeah, great question. So, I mean, I'm not aware of studies where they've compared like behavioral plus um, medication treatments, partially because we just don't know what we're doing with medications. I think for opioids, it's very different. We know there have actually been several randomized controlled trials looking at um, whether behavioral treatments, you know, are helpful, especially early in treatment in addition to medications. And we don't think that that's necessarily the case. Um, great for folks that want that type of support, but not like a man, shouldn't be a mandatory thing. I think it's a little bit different with methamphetamines where really, you know, that we think the evidence is best around behavioral treatment. So I, you know, we should be really encouraging folks to access those kind of plus minus the medications. Um, you know, I, um, you know, reten treatment retention is important for many, many reasons. I think treatment retention is important um, because that's the way that we can, um, try to help people stay safer. And that's the way we can help support folks um, if there is kind of um, something incipient happening, you know, we can hopefully kind of catch that earlier, whether it's a medical complication or a mental health complication. Um, so, uh, you know, they look at lots of outcomes, but, you know, I, I think folks increasingly recognize that, that importance of um, treatment retention. The other, you know, the other, outcome that is increasingly recognized and acknowledged is, you know, instead of just focusing on abstinence, um, you know, focusing on um, trying to do our best to quantify like amount of use. So maybe using less or using less intensely or using uh, less frequently are all should be valid outcomes um, when we're studying these different options. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, Sri. <laughs> yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. What other questions do folks have before we take our break? I, I, I think I just um, thrown my two cents about in terms of clinical interactions with folks where with problematic methamphetamine use or compulsive use despite harm it. Um, I think like with any substance, you, you kind of want to get a sense of what the, um, uh, you know, what, what are the benefits, you know, why are they using or what are the perceived reasons for using? And then a lot of times with methamphetamines, you'll get kind of, you'll hear, you know, people who are, particularly people who are homeless or living in vulnerable situations that it's almost perceived as a, um, as a defense against uh, uh, abuse or theft, you know, allowing people to remain, uh, remain vigilant or awake uh, so that 
things don't get stolen. And so a lot of the use is really tied into, can, can be tied into um, uh, a lot of concerns in that area. So, you know, talking about retention, if you can help people meet some of those goals outside of re even reducing their drug use, if that's great if that's what they want to do. But if, it, you know, if their goals are surround maybe access to a safer living environment, housing, you know, so, uh, social services, I think, you know, focusing in that area might help uh, eventually, uh, you know, if that if they're kind of that those perceived triggers really bear out, uh, but also just help to let the patient know you're, you're, you know, engaged in helping them achieve some of their goals. That's a, a lot of what the harm reduction treatment modality is about. It's about it's not just saying, hey, here's a safer way to uh, ingest medications. It's about what, are, what, how can I help? What are your goals in terms of, of, um, of being safer or, or um, uh, use it and how you want to change your relationship with substances or, um, and how can we kind of help you get there? That's great, Jamie. So a question from Marita is about what percentage of folks with meth use have undiagnosed ADHD and are self-treating. You know, I don't know about undiagnosed, but there are high um, rates of ADHD in folks with methamphetamine use or upwards of like a third or more of folks with methamphetamine use or have co-occurring ADHD. I don't, it's not always clear like whether that's undiagnosed at some point or not currently treated or, um, but it is, you know, that's very common along with many other co-occurring um, mental health conditions. Um, so, and thank you, Anisha, for sharing your story. That's very sweet. Um, just shows how these things kind of travel together, um, unfortunately, um, and all the structural and um, anyway, don't need to go there right now. Let's take a break <laughs> um, for um, maybe just a few minutes, like five minutes or so, and let's come back and we'll do a breakout session um, with these cases that Shri put in the chat. So you might want to take a moment during the break to download the, download the case so you have it kind of readily available. And then um, Shri or Javel, we could just kind of randomly, I think, break uh, um, you know, split folks up into about three equal groups and um, Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Darton and I will um, each kind of help facilitate the discussion. So looking forward to it. See everybody back in maybe uh, five minutes. Sounds good. <laughs> 